So what is a biological network? A biological network is any system of subunits that are interconnected or linked to the whole. Almost any biological process is a biological network. For example, one of the most widely known is the food web, in which animals are connected to each other through their interactions for food. If a species eats or is eaten by another species, the two are connected to each other and to the bigger web. An example on the micro level would be a gene regulatory network, which is a collection of molecules that interact with each other in order to control different cell functions. Other examples on the micro level include neural nets and signal transduction pathways. These biological networks can also be represented as graphs. A graphical representation of a biological network consists of a collection of nodes or vertices that are connected by edges. Each node represents a single unit within the network, and each edge represents the interaction or relationship between two nodes or two units. There are different types of graphs to represent them, and one of these graphs is called an undirected graph, where the nodes are linked by edges with no particular order. Biological networks, however, are usually represented by directed graphs, where each node-to-node -node connection has a direction. For example, within the food web, a, an edge usually extends from the prey to the predator. Every biological network, or most biological networks, should have network motifs. A motif is a repeated pattern that plays a larger role within the system. A network motif is a subgraph of a biological network. Graphically, these are represented as a collection of nodes and edges that are repeated throughout the entire network. These motifs can be simple, such as the four-node biparallel food web motif, which indicates that two species preyed on by the same predator tend to share the same prey. The biparallel motif also demonstrates the importance of motifs in biological networks, because it is thought to create stability within the food web. Each predator consumes one species strongly and the other weakly, which is thought to create a more balanced environment and is the reason why this pattern, why this pattern is a motif. Other examples of motifs can be more com complex, such as the gene factor motif or other network motifs in gene regulatory networks. Every motif is different because they all serve different purposes. Motifs exist to help the network execute its job. In this particular example, the job of a food web is to ensure that there is a flow of energy and a balance from the bottom to the top of the food chain, whereas in a gene regulatory network, the, their job is to process information and control cells. The networks have separate purposes, so the motifs that exist within them are extremely different. So moving on, we're going to talk about specific motifs and their connections. So the first motif I want to talk about is autoregulation, specifically in E. coli. Autoregulation, aka self-regulation, is the simplest network motif, consisting of self-arrows, which are arrows that originate and end at the same node. Specifically, the E. coli network has 40 self-arrows. These arrows correspond to transcription factors that regulate the transcription of their own genes. This is essentially the definition of autoregulation, regulation of a gene by its own gene product. 34 of the autoregulatory proteins in the E. coli network are actually repressors which means they stop their own transcription. This is known as negative autoregulation. Looking at the diagram, negative autoregulation occurs when a transcription factor, in this case X, represses its own transcription. This self-repression occurs when X binds its own promoter in order to inhibit the production of mRNA. And as a result, the higher the concentration of X, the lower its production rate. Moving on to feed forward loops, those are patterns consisting of multiple nodes and arrows known as subgraphs. Going back to E. coli, it serves as a great example. As I said, there are 40 self-arrows. Looking at the diagram, the feed-forward loop consists of an input gene, X, that regulates an immediate gene, Y, while both X and Y regulate an output gene, which is Z. The feed-forward loop occurs much more often than at random. In sensory transcription networks similar to E. coli, the feed-forward loop is the only significant network motif. Developmental transcription networks occur in multicellular organisms. These networks basically govern the irreversible changes that occur when a cell transforms itself into a different type of cell. 
Developmental transcription networks of organisms like fruit flies, worms, and humans are composed of several strong network motifs, and they display most of the ones that we find in sensory networks. Primarily, they exhibit positive autoregulation. This is different from just standard autoregulation, and what differentiates it from regular autoregulation is that it can make sharp decisions between two states and then remember that decision that it made for a long time. Through Darwinian evolution, mutations that provide increased fitness or the ability to survive and reproduce will be selected and will become more common over multiple generations. Therefore, if a biological motif survives the natural selection process and lasts many generations, it must have great significance and contribute to the organism's fitness. Bacteria replicates extremely quickly, and mutations occur rapidly, which makes bacteria ideal to observe the natural selection of vital motifs. The connection between evolution and biological motifs leads to two fundamental ideas. Motifs can be discovered through evolutionary biology, and motifs can be utilized to reveal patterns in evolution and find connections between species. The first step to discover a motif in an organism is to use computational techniques to find a reoccurring sequence. Once the organism's genome is sequenced, any string of nucleotides that repeat significantly more frequently than it would if the genome were randomly created is a possible motif. Next, ideas of evolution can be applied in multiple ways to determine if the reoccurring sequence is a motif. One option is to determine whether the same sequence repeats in other species, especially those which share a common ancestor with the organism in question. If the sequence is present in other species, it is probable that the sequence is being acted on by positive selective pressure, meaning that natural selection caused it to become more common or remain in the genome as species evolved over multiple generations. This is a sign that the sequence plays a vital or fundamental role in the organism, and therefore could be a biological motif. A second method utilizing evolutionary biology is to determine the rate of evolution of the reoccurring sequence. By studying rapidly replicating organisms like bacteria, the rate at which the sequence changes and mutates over multiple generations can be calculated. If the rate is lower than the average rate of change of the genome, it is likely that the sequence plays a fundamental role, as natural selection is not selecting against it. So, the sequence could be a biological motif. After applying these concepts of evolution, the motif could be confirmed through further experiments, such as knocking out the sequence and observing protein changes in the organism, which would determine whether the sequence has a significant function. The process can be reversed, and motifs can help find evolutionary relationships. Genome sequencing allows us to determine if an organism utilizes a certain motif. If the genomes of two species both contain a motif, it is very likely that they share a common ancestor. Using this idea, we can discover common ancestors and calculate genetic distances in order to construct phylogenetic trees. This information is extremely useful for biological research. If two species have common ancestors, or are genetically similar, one species' genome can be used to replicate the others. In other words, the two species function similarly, and the effect of a drug or gene on one species will be the same as the effect on the other species. One example of an application of this idea is the discovery of the CTCF, or 11-zinc finger protein motif, in humans and mice. The CTCF motif regulates the transcription of genes that code for important proteins and regulates the 3D structure of chromatin. Thus, the CTCF motif has a vital role in the genome. The fact that humans and mice share such a fundamental motif suggests that their genomes and proteins function very similarly which means that mice can be used to accurately represent human responses in biological research. So in addition to genetic networks, motifs can be found just about anywhere where there is a network, and almost all biological systems are controlled by some underlying networks. So for the sake of time, we won't go into depth into other networks, but a notable one that comes to mind is a neural network. So here we can think of neural somas as nodes and extending axons as directed edges. 
In addition, neural network motifs are unique because they can be categorized as stru structural or functional. Structural motifs can refer to a collection of neurons that make up the physical motif, but within that, there are many configurations that produce different responses. These configurations can be seen as functional motifs. Uh, it's also notable that unlike gene networks, neuronal motifs can be drastically different based on their responses because of the neurotransmitters at work, and that the response may not be some binary spectrum like gene regulation is. So another system that we can look at is signaling pathways. So here motifs produce some specific response that drives the function of these pathways. And an example is uh, signal cascades or even memory creation. So the point of this is to show that network motifs can be found everywhere and control many underlying functions. The question then becomes, how can we find these motifs? This is where computation comes in. The motif finding problem has been around for about two decades and revolves around treating the network as a graph and a motif as a subgraph. Uh, so then the question becomes, how can we find these subgraphs within the main graph? However, we have to note that not every subgraph is a motif, only the ones that are overrepresented in the graph. So this may seem relatively simple, but even modern day algorithms can't quickly compute motifs of size five or greater. This is because graph isomorphism, uh, an algorithm that checks if graphs are equivalent, is extremely time consuming. And also because the number of subgraphs or candidate motifs increases exponentially with each additional node. So in the next few slides, we'll go over the basic steps of motif finding and how different algorithms have modified these to increase their efficiency. So to recap, this is our motif finding problem. Uh, we input a graph big G as our network, wanting to find motifs up to size big K. We also pass along some frequency threshold F and also some statistical significance test. Uh, and then we want to output all the subgraphs in big G with size of up to two to big K nodes. Uh, so the first step in any motif finding algorithm is always to generate the candidate motifs or subgraphs. Uh, the two main methods of motif finding are termed network centric or motif centric, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, however, both methods uh, have uh, generating subgraphs as their first step. Uh, this is most commonly done through a pattern growth tree. Uh, so with each level of the tree, a node or an edge of the base subgraph can be changed to produce a child subgraph. And then these children can also have a node or an edge changed to produce, produce their children's subgraphs. Uh, so eventually we'll create all the necessary subgraphs. Uh, so some notable algorithms uh, increase this efficiency in finding the subgraphs. An algorithm called Kavash modifies the tree uh, so that there's no repeat subgraphs. Um, this saves time because we're only going through unique subgraphs. And also an algorithm called Mavisto removes subgraphs that are obviously not going to pass our frequency test or our statistical significance test. So this saves us time later. So the second common step is subgraph census, or a way to count the instances of a specific subgraph. There are several methods to do this, uh, ranging from exact searching uh, to sampling or even a technique called mapping. So exact search methods uh, will go through the entire graph checking for isomorphism, uh, which results in an extremely time consuming process. However, it's still commonly used among uh, algorithms because of its exactness and also uh, some relatively efficient algorithms like uh, Naughty. The uh, second and much faster method is through sampling. Uh, here we can take a random or weighted sample, uh, whichever we think is uh, best for representing the graph and test it against the motif. Uh, this approach is much faster, but there's always a chance of misrepresenting the sampling frame of our whole graph. So while most algorithms will follow these two steps to find motifs, they can be split up into two general groups. Uh, network centric motifs first generate all possible subgraphs of the given network, and then they have to perform subgraph census for each subgraph to find the valid motifs that pass our significance test. On the other hand, motif uh, centric methods will generate every possible subgraph of size k, but they can then directly find the frequency of every motif through a mapping method, which ends up being much faster than subgraph census. Uh, this mapping method works by trying to map the subgraph to as many different places on the graphs as possible. So both uh, methods have their advantages and their disadvantages.
So here we can see a classification of several well-known algorithms for motif finding, as well as their performance. So we can see that network-centric algorithms are more popular and also generally faster than motif-centric algorithms. Uh, we can also see that exact search algorithms can be quite fast uh, as seen with Kavash, and this is because of the really efficient pattern growth tree step that only takes in unique subgraphs. Uh, so overall, there's been a lot of progress since the creation of mFinder, which was the first uh, motif finding algorithm about two decades ago. But we can still quickly see the limits of current computational power uh, and that it takes Kavash a really long time uh, just to find 10 node motifs. So what can we take away from motifs? As we've said before, networks control almost every aspect of life from behavior to gene expression and much more. We also know that these networks are comprised of motifs and serve a specific purpose uh, and allow these networks and therefore life to function. By understanding and analyzing these motifs, we can learn more about their evolutionary relationships between species and how they contribute to biological research. We can also get closer to answering uh, the really general question of how life really works. Uh, and with more and more computational tools and algorithms, we can continue to explore the extent and breadth of these motifs. Uh, so this has been Biodiversity, and thank you for listening.